Thank you for the message of Dr. Ali yesterday when she, when she mentioned the ACE. ACE being authenticated resource is very important right from the very start. And if I change my hat and think of myself as a researcher before, as a, as a graduate student before, I was so thankful when, when I was getting the material for the thesis and I was surprised with the way the materials are taken just from one place in Germany, in Gathers Leben, and then you have the authenticated sample, the batch, the, even the percent germination is written there. So when I did the biorepository, but rather when I did the biotechnology work, I was happy with the data that I have, and it got reflected even in the results which I got for biotechnology. But for this morning, let's look at the Philippine Biorepository Network, and this time we change hat in a way, not as a researcher, but somebody who takes care of a resource center. Nice picture of biodiversity, right? Can you guess how many plants are there? And then, if you're a Filipino, can you spot one of the ten DOS recommended plant? This is in front of the Institute of the Biological Sciences a few years back. And this is the that is the medicinal plant. And that is what we call Mansit Pansitan. So the Philippines and practically many other countries and the Philippines sharing the Malaysian flora is really rich in biodiversity, terrestrial, marine, and otherwise. And this is the other picture. This was taken from Global Taxonomy some time back. And uh, when this was presented, and this was taken from Anderson um, 2001, the floral kingdom, and at the same time, the botanical hotspots of the world. I was shocked. We just took the ASEAN level here, but there is a whole picture. And look at the Philippines. All islands are in red. All islands are losing its material. So, especially for medicinal plants, this is very important. And so, we have looked at our national document. The one that will come out is the Philippine Pharmacopoeia. We just have the first uh, volume now. A second volume is being prepared. And in this case, there are only 27 plant species listed there. If we're going to have a bioresource, we have to take care that we follow the World Health Organization guideline, especially for agricultural and collection of medicinal plants that we really present in the garden and in the bioresource centers the actual material which is cited in a national document. And this is our national document. At the same time, we also talk the uh, Chamber of Herbal Industries who may have ideas about important medicinal plants who want to translate research to actual public service and in this case in the industry reaching the people. So we also refer to the chippy, what we call chippy. And uh, this is the list of the 10 DOS recommended medicinal plants. These are the four tips coming from the herbal industry. And we're thankful to the initiative, or uh, rather, let me go back to this one. And if we look at plants in general, even if you go in the small gardens outside of the Spanish or in the Spanish, you will see that misidentification is there. Even if there is an Ateneo thesis by Vivian Valentino over a decade back about Sembella Shadiba, you can see the two others genera are confused with this. And if you know which one is the real Sembella Shadiba, There are three, and you can see that the centella shatika is actually the one at the right corner above, and the other two. Likewise, it was a surprise for us that of the ten recommended medicinal plants, and the top is Vitex Megundo in the country, in the Philippines, there are more than probably eight morphotypes. There is a great variation, and there is a great plasticity in the plant itself as you go through time. Okay. 
The third challenge that I could present to you before I present PPM is if you consider the Spanios, many commercial gardens are here. There are many ornamental plants being sold. And this is a good example. Priscolis indica or Pobretum is one of the ten medicinal plants. The herbal drug is the seed. But if you have ornamental species, you lose typically the fruit and the seed. And if it is edging on, this is one, uh, one problem or what you, can so, what you can consider a threat to conservation and uh, for biodiversity. The ornamental is edging out the native wild type. And if you look at agriculture, if you look at ornamentals, what is bred are the beautiful ones, what is bred are the good tasting ones, the tricky ones. We're not breeding much yet for medicinals and bioactive components. So this is another threat that we can consider. We're thankful to the DOPST, to the national government, and uh, through PCHR, the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, because they came up with this idea of Philippine Biorepository Network starting off with the medicinal plants. I think we have some from PCHR. Yeah. Oh. Here, yeah. so they are here. So, in this case, the Philippine Biorepository Network is composed of five different projects. Right from the top, we have the live plants in the garden, but the garden is just a showcase. We can afford a big garden for all the variants and all the medicinal plants. The second one to the right, uh, if you look at it clockwise, we have the seed um, biorepository. So the seeds are not just there, but the seed behavior and some other things are tested. I'll go to the details of it later. The third one, bottom right, is for the extracts, plant extracts. And the next one is for the DNA, RNA. And the last one is the most important, I believe, right from the very start, database management. So sample management and database management are very important. And I'm so thankful as I listened yesterday to the lectures. If we are taking time, it's understandable, putting things together. And uh, this is a good opportunity for us to harmonize with the other repositories uh, internationally and at the same time regionally and even at the night at the nation level. This is the group sometime back when we had a sample and the laboratory protocol workshop and bank representation of the different projects. And this is the list of uh, the project leaders for live plants, myself, then uh, we have uh, Professor Borromeo for the seed, Sonia Hacinto for the extracts, uh, Marian Bautista for the DNA-RNA, and uh, Roy Lewis for the database, to the different institution. Allow me to go to each of these institutions or each of these projects to present to you the Life plants. We're thankful that the Chancellor of UPLB um, allowed us to use the fourth core chart, rather third core chart of the IDS and the Institute of Biological Sciences. We're just starting. We had the, the tree spelled off and with the permit, of course, of the ENR and then clearing the area. And the hardscape will be uh, the construction of the hardscape. Uh, we we learned terms. Now there's a hardscape and a softscape if you look at the garden. So the construction of the hardscape will um, start soon. The bidding for the construction will take place next week. This is the area. It's just 1,000 meters square. And we have, it, of course, the collaboration with the Museum of Natural History. Later, I realized we also need help from the plant pest clinic. And help is there just to make sure that the garden is moving well. Hopefully, this will be the pre-runs of the hardscape before the garden uh, softscape is placed in. Since you're going to make a garden of medicinal plants, you must have reasons why this particular plant is there. But if you look at our list, some of the plants are already in pharmacopoeia. Some not there, some are traditional. Others that we're going to include are those plants that cause confusion, like Centella ashatita. Or we can highlight also plants that are 
being edged out by ornamentals. All these things we would like to place in a learning area and we need to do some pharmacognostic study. So we included that in our project. If you look at the upper portion, you know, trichomes, when you look at it as a botanist, trichomes are just trichomes. But when you look at it as a medicinal plant level, it, is, it gives more other information. The same way the bark is just a bark, but if you look at the lower portion, you can see the bark of Sincona, and Sincona bark has this particular white exolate coming out, and it will be reflected there. The food industry also teaches us that if you look at cinnamon, cinnamon that you use for food, the bark, the way it curves will give you an idea whether it's the cinnamon cilantro or if it's another one. So we're learning, we're learning all together about these things. And we're coming up also with the data that is um, presented to the right about the plant material. Herbarium will be here. And a modest display cabinet. That's for project one. Project two, we're so happy that we link up with the National Plant Genetic Resources Laboratory. By the way, when we consider the bioresource just like yesterday, a continuity is a problem, funding is a problem. So right from the start, the OSD Philippines um, presented this problem to us, and at best, we link up with institutions. And in this case, the first one is secured at the IBS courtyard, the second will be, is linked up with the National Plant Genetic Resources Laboratory. The implementing institution is the College of Agriculture and Food Science, specifically the Institute of Crop Science, iCrops. So in this case, what NPGR is actually doing is looking at the biodiversity of cash crops, more of crops, but this time medicinal will be included. And it's not just getting the biodiversity, but also looking at the seed behavior. Let's have two examples. These are just some of the variations in the Lundi. There are many variations in Vitex and Google. And Vitex and Google is already in the market for a number of years. We go back to the pharmacopoeia, we have the description, but somehow the voucher specimen, we're not quite sure whether it's, it's this or not. We've been working on this since 2004, test for Mayo and I, and they're, and they're prepared at the time for information gathering. And we're even, even right now, we're very really, we're surprised at the number of variations that we see. This they presented, project two presented, some time back, and this is routine that they do. They look at the seed, they grow it, and they have, uh, they consider the plant characteristics. Now we learn from them that there are orthodox seeds that, you know, grow and requirements are the same. But there are seeds that have more requirements than the orthodox. If you look at the bioresource, you have to know whether is it self-pollinating or is it cross-breeding? Is it being uh, produced just vegetatively or you need fertilization for this? Because it can change the genetic material. And in time, what do you have in your biorepository? Is it true to type or not? So these things are being considered by project two. Project 3 actually is the one that started it off because there was a need. Uh, in another project, DBHP, in that, uh, as lead in Kiliman, they already have the extracts. And these are being um, uh, deposited. But you have to go back to your bioresource. You have to check the material, the authentication. So this is being continued by Dr. Jacinto and uh, this is IB Institute of uh, Biology. Then there is the, you know, the typical extraction procedure, the drying, maceration, and the concentration, and then eventually the storage. But they have to be really strict with this and with higher level of uh, equipment needs. Some of the equipment needs are here. And we're talking a little bit earlier, Dr. Saloma is also mentioning, we have to optimize the equipment that we have in the country um, that is needed, no? So we have to really link up and know where the equipment are and make use of it, optimize the use of all the equipment that we have. 
The last one, we we'll look at the DNA and RNA. And this is centered at the Philippine Genome Center. And uh, this is a picture, this is in UB Diliman. So the classic way of studying plants, we have the methods, sample collection, standardization. This time, key is the standardization of protocols for DNA and RNA extraction. And we're looking at the possibility of uh, advanced way of storing your material, your DNA samples. And um, this is not, this doesn't give a problem of space. All others may give a problem of space, but this one, you need, of course, quality equipment for keeping the material. I think we have some representatives from Project 5. I, I think I saw some yesterday. And this is an example of the plate that they prepared using the primers used for barcoding, but also including nuclear genes, this time suggested some by some of the elevators, and finding a better way of storage, which is less expensive and uh, stable also. I consider the significance of the last slide because it also touches the importance of all the other projects. So this is from project four that goes with all the other projects. If you have the bioresource at the first circle and you can archive it or you can have it as a collection or as a life plant collection, then the application is big. You have plant breeding, biotechnology, biodiversity conservation, and right at the top is authentication. You go back to authentication. Researchers would rather that is really authenticating than what you have in your hand. So who takes, the, who takes care of all this data? It's the fifth project, PBN Bioinformatics. Special one picture of Dr. Luis Ma, because <laughs> I just learned lately that there's also a change of uh, researchers, the need for researchers. You remember computer science, people get in and out, and you really need the human resource, which should not be forgotten. So it's Dr. Luis Ma who introduced us to keywords like capture point and business model. We, we, we didn't know about, I did, not, I did not know about these things, but we have to learn it together. We had and bank workshops and seminars for this, for the PBN people and learning about these things. So this is an example of a business model of a pro project. We harmonized even the terminologies. Included also is the coming up of material transfer agreement. This is prepared. This was prepared by the group of Dr. Asinto and the other guidelines that may take some years for shorter time, one or two years to come up with. We need to harmonize, we need to interface with the international and the regional bioresource centers. And lastly, we hope that the bioresource or resource research center like a PBM can help in preventing degradation on the left side and at the same time help in providing material, authenticated material, for utilization like in biotechnology studies on the right side. So with that, before the bioresource is lost uh, with us together, we can work together to take care of our bioresources. Thank you very much.